So closure, uh, I, obviously Rich Hickey gave the keynote this morning. Hopefully that intrigued you to maybe uh, understand the kinds of things that um, he's built and, and look at those sorts of things. Um, I have been doing software development since I was a kid um, and professionally for you know, 15, 17, something like that years now. Um, I did a little bit of C++ work and then spent a long time in Java, um, uh, did all sorts of things in Java. Uh, and about, uh, especially I did a lot of uh, career optimization and data integration work. And w about three and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to um, work on a new system and, and had a, a lot of uh, say in what the language is going to be. Uh, and I'd been reading about Clojure and Scala and, and some of the other uh, languages that were coming out in the JVM. And so we, uh, I had a small team and we tried out a few of them and we ended up deciding uh, to go with Clojure. Uh, and that team is still using Clojure today. Uh, we have uh, maybe 60, 80,000 lines of Clojure. Um, so we've got a large, uh, a large body of, uh, so I've, I've written a lot of Clojure uh, over the last few years <laughs> in summary. And before that, I wrote a lot of Java. So. Um, so I have a lot of experience in both of those, and uh, I'm mostly going to be talking from that point of view. Um, although, so I'm going to talk about Java off and on a bit. Um, you can replace that with whatever your object-oriented experience is. I think it's probably pretty uh, comparable to the level that I'm talking about. Um, so the, the five areas that I want to talk about today, I want to talk about the difference between values and objects. Uh, and this is uh, going to be uh, just a... Uh, short little uh, intro here. And then in terms of closure, uh, parts of closure that I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna talk about the collections. Uh, I'm gonna talk about sequences. I'm gonna talk about generic data interfaces. And I'm gonna talk about identity and state. Um, there are another five, 10 major areas that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, so <laughs> you're not gonna know everything there is to know about closure by the end of this talk, but hopefully you'll, uh, these are some of the areas that um, I have found have really made a difference to me. Uh, and I think will help you get a feel for why uh, I think Clojure is a, uh, a, a really great language to program in. Uh, so I'm gonna start by talking about uh, values and what is a value. Uh, these are some pieces of definitions I've pulled off of various you know, dictionary sites and things like that. Um, and, but I think they each kind of get to a little bit of, of what I think is important, uh, this notion of precision, like I mean some specific thing uh, when I talk about a value, uh, a particular thing, uh, and that thing has some intrinsic value, some semantic value that I want to communicate to somebody else. Uh, and we can agree, on, we, it, we can uh, indisputably agree on what those things are. So if we have something like 20, like you know what 20 is, I know what 20 is. There's different ways to represent 20, you know, two's complement or this or that. I mean, there's lots of different ways to represent it. Um, but it has a precise meaning and it's semantically evident what, what we mean by that. Um, so floating point numbers, booleans, um, A as a character, um, uh, even strings. Um, strings are not necessarily immutable in every language, but in most languages people are using today, they are immutable. Um, so I'm gonna take those as, as one of, another kind of value uh, for the purposes of this talk. Um, and all of these things are immutable. That's sort of another uh, fundamental aspect of this. Um, that we're gonna come back to many times. Um, because they have this semantically evident meaning, it also means that they are, um, we can compare them for equality. Like we know what these things mean, we can compare two of them. If we're in the same representation, they probably have the same bits underlying them. Um, that's, not, that's not a requirement, but, um, but I think that's one way to think about it, what a value is. Um, so what about composite values? We really want, this is a standard composite design pattern, right? We really want values that compose. We wanna start from these primitive values and have some way to create a composite that contains primitives or other composites, some way that we can create uh, bigger data structures that have those same properties. Um, so I think naturally um, a question you might ask is, are objects composite values? Um, William Cook, uh, Wrote, uh, wrote up something last year. He was really, he's a uh, ac um, professor, I think, and he was trying to pull together a lot of definitions of OO and sort of build a modern definition of OO. And he, he wrote a very, this is a very lengthy uh, thing, which I have completely uh, just extracted a few sentences that I wanted to talk about. 
Uh, and I'm not doing it justice at all. There's a lot of really interesting, useful stuff in the, in the description. So it's worth going and reading the whole thing and forming your own judgment about. Um, but this first line is sort of the, the beginning of the definition, is that it's a first class, dynamically dispatched behavior. And I'm not gonna talk about the behavior aspect at all. I'm really interested in the data aspect. Um, so, and he says, uh, this first class notion is really that objects can be passed around just like primitive values. So you can pass them in as into, uh, into methods, you can get them as return values, and that sort of thing. And that there's this sort of, uh, objects can be, re can be re uh, substituted for value. Um, and uh, I'm gonna fundamentally disagree with this. <laughs> so uh, I, I, it is partially true, like it is a composite. It collects fields together that, so you're, you are creating a composite. Um, but I'm gonna contend that it's not a value in the way that we want to talk about values. Um, objects are typically mutable. So, and that's like one of the most fundamental ways where we sort of diverge at that point. Um, so and there also, if you look at like comparison for equality, like how many, like I, if you've written OO code, you've written equals methods, right? Um, with a composite value, you should not have to write an equals method. It should be semantically evident whether two things are equal or not. Um, so that's another, it's just sort of indicator. And we're gonna come back to some of the problems with this uh, at the end when we talk about identity and state. And I'm not gonna talk about it too much right now. Um, some of the signs, these are some other signs that mutable objects may not really be what you want for composite values, that this notion of equality or the notion that um, to uh, get a, a, to see the state of, a, of an object that you have to defensively copy it out. And you see that at the end, you see that um, when you need to, if anybody's worked with caching systems where you needed to defensively clone an object before you put it into a cache so that it didn't get messed up by somebody else pulling it out of the cache later. Or if you're in queuing objects and you need to make sure that that's a, an immutable copy or something like that of the original object. Or if you've had trouble writing serialization code or uh, composing thread safe objects. Like all of these are hard because of mutability. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna contend that mutable objects are not composite values. Um, and uh, I'm happy to argue about that later. <laughs> if, you wanna, um, if you want to see a much longer treatment of this, um, Rich's talk, The Value of Values, which is out on InfoQ, uh, is a great uh, sort of, but hour long um, uh, defense of this argument. So I'm not gonna go further. Um, and I, I'm gonna say that this, that what I just talked about, this notion of um, moving from mutable objects to immutable composite values is the most fundamental thing that uh, changed the way I think about programming. And, and it really did. I, like, I, I really had gotten to a point with Java where I'd done everything there was to do with Java pretty much, and at one point or another, uh, and really could not stand to write another <laughs> iterator loop or another ob class, and was thinking about just doing something totally different because uh, I would, had kinda, I was just tired of it. I was tired of dealing with all the problems that come out from mutable state. And, uh, uh, I, I, really, I really thank Rich for, uh, <laughs> for showing up at the right time for me um, personally, uh, because that really, uh, it, I say this seriously, it will change the way you think about programming uh, to start from immutability like this. Um, you'll design and write code differently. Uh, so, uh, the roadmap, so we're on to collections. So uh, before we get into collections, just a real brief thing. So it looked like most people were, uh, there's a lot of familiarity with Clojure already. Um, but it's a Lisp dialect on the JVM. There's also a Clojure script, which compiles to JavaScript, and there's a Clojure CLR. Uh, it's dynamically typed. It's compiled. There is no interpreter. Even if you're typing in a REPL, each expression you type is compiled into a class and dynamically loaded into, a, into the, the class loader. So you're always in compiled mode. Uh, and it embraces functional programming, but also does not uh, rely strictly on functional programming. It's, it's I'd say it's, uh, it, it's not a pure functional programming language like Haskell or something like that. Uh, it embraces, uh, I think, very pragmatic concerns of uh, things we need to do to write programs to do things we need them to do. Um, so some of the primitives out there, this is how they look in Clojure, so all this is valid Clojure code. Um, most of these probably look, are things you would expect to see um, you'll notice it's nil instead of null, which is what you'd see in Java. Um, 
you might notice the 22 over 7 is a, is a literal uh, rational, so it's a fraction. Um, those are supported in the language. Aren't, I don't see them used very often, but it's nice to have them there um, in the cases where you do need them. Uh, the slash A is a character, a single character, so instead of a tick something, right, it's a slash A, and then strings at the end. So this is not all of the primitives, but it's ones you might be interested in. Um, so closure collections, there's literally four major uh, closure collections that are, that are provided for you. Um, there are also uh, queues, which I'm not gonna talk about, and which aren't used that commonly. Um, and there are also sorted versions of the maps and sets, but uh, they really still conform to the same interfaces and look pretty much the same as these. Um, so uh, vectors are kind of like Aurelius in Java. They're, um, they're expandable, um, indexed collections. So, um, and vectors are what you use constantly in Clojure. They're very, so they're, it's very, you see them all over the place. Um, as you add items, they add to the end of the vector. Um, they, um, I guess is all I want to say about that. Um, uh, lists are sort of the classic Lisp data structure. So it's a, a linked list type, uh, 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 that sort of structure that you're expecting. Uh, new items get added to the front because you just add the cons, the a new value on the front and then point to the old, old list. Um, so the, these are used for closure code is just lists, that's all it is. Um, and they're used for other things too, but uh, that's where you see them most frequently. Um, maps are a series of, it's a dictionary or hash table, it's sets of key value pairs. Uh, I've separated the two here with a comma. Commas are white space enclosure. So uh, I put it there for clarity in this case, but it's totally optional. Um, the beginning, uh, the keys here, you'll notice, are these colon prefixed things. Um, those are keywords. Um, if, um, so keywords are always basically evaluated to themselves and they have sort of the similarity to things like intern strings in Java. So uh, they are, they are um, very fast for comparison and uh, idiomatically used as keys in, in maps in particular, and also for other things like constants, um, enumerated values, and things like that. Uh, and we'll see them lots in this talk uh, anytime we're using maps. Uh, so here, first name and last name really represent like fields in, in, a, in a map. Um, and then sets, of course, are just elements that are distinct, uh, non-overlapping elements, and they don't have any order semantics to it. It's an unordered set. And maps similarly are not, uh, don't have any particular order necessarily. Um, so all of these are immutable composite values. These are, these are not objects, these are real composite values. Um, you can nest them arbitrarily, any of, you know, in the map, the keys or the values could be vectors or lists or sets or maps or other primitives, that's all fine. Um, equality uh, is based on um, a combination of the equality partition and the contents of the uh, collection. So you're not defining equality or anything like that. Um, vectors and lists are in sort of a sequential uh, partition. There's really three partitions, sequential, map, and set. And uh, vectors and lists and some other stuff fall into that sort of sequential partition. And you're just gonna look at the elements in each in turn, and then you're going to recursively sort of compare those for equality um, all down the line. Uh, so, and then maps, uh, you're just comparing key value, all the, uh, two maps are the same if they have the same keys with the same values. And that's, again, a recursive thing that happens. Um, and sets, I think, should be obvious. So, that's all, um, that's all good. So, I, I would say, Closure collections are real composite values, and they, they really have this substitution quality that you can replace them for values and functions, and they, they are better that way. Um, you, the other sort of aspect of it is you can sort of perceive them as a whole. So you can, um, it, because it's immutable, you can look at different sub subcomponents, nested things, all that, and you're never gonna get messed up by somebody else that's changing the thing underneath you, because that's not possible. Uh, there are lots of collection functions out there. Uh, they're sort of uh, part of the core library. Um, all of these have the ability to count them. Uh, conj is short for conjoin, and that's the way that you sort of um, add an element to a collection in, in the natural way for that collection. So 
vectors add to the end, lists add to the beginning, sets add into the set, uh, maps add a new key value pair. Um, seek will return a sequence, which is what we'll next, next major topic we're gonna talk about. Uh, into allows you to pour one collection into another and retain that collection type. Uh, empty gives you back an empty uh, form of the collection you have. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all these, but like lists allows you to get the first and the rest. Um, both vector and list allow you to uh, walk in and get a particular nth value in the middle of it. Um, list is gonna perform a sequential search through that to get there. Um, vector is indexed, so it's actually gonna be able to go directly to the right, uh, to the right index. Um, you can pull out sub vectors, replace things. Maps uh, really deal with associ and dissociate here, or associate and dissociate are ways that you add new key value pairs into it. And you can do things like merge maps and check for containment, get sub maps with select keys, uh, things like that. Um, sets uh, work the way you expect them to, and dis the disch is a hard thing to say, but that's short for disjoin, which is kind of the opposite of conjoin, which is a way to remove elements from the set. Um, and then there's a bunch of relational algebra set, op, set functions that you can use as well, which are useful if you're using sets. Um, I want to do, I'm going to real quickly here go to, uh, so uh, just do a little bit of demo to get the little bit of that feel in there. Um, so uh, I'm running Lighttable here, which is a new IDE uh, for Clojure and also JavaScript and I think very soon Python. Um, that's, it was a Kickstarter project last year. Uh, it's, it's not ready for production use, I would say, <laughs> but uh, uh, I've been experimenting with it just because I thought it was, uh, it, it's, uh, it's got some nice properties in terms of uh, live evaluation. So here it's actually like evaluating things. And um, so uh, let's see, so if we uh, create a new vector, um, get that to evaluate, there we go. So I just created a, uh, that V there is a var, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but it's basically a uh, place for us to store things, right? So it's not a value, it's a var, um, which associates a name, binds a name to a value. Um, so I can uh, take that and I can conjoin uh, that V, I can add a new element to it, right? Uh, so you see the four was added on the end there, and I've still got a vector, that's great. Um, I can actually go back and look at V, and you'll notice that V is unchanged, right? So these are immutable data structures. So when I, if I wanted to do something with this uh, vector that has the new four on the end, I need to capture that and do something with that. Uh, it's a new value, um, so V is one value. The conj, this value right here is, a, is another value, which if I want to do something with, I can. So this is the difference between working with mutable data structures and immu immutable data structures. Uh, and that's where it comes up, really. Um, and uh, that's, I know that when I first went into it that it seemed weird for about a day, and then I stopped thinking about it, and it was really not a big deal. <laughs> so uh, it uh, really, I, I don't know about other people, but for me, it, it didn't take long to get used to it. Um, so here I've got a map, um, which I've put in the apple var. It's got a name key, uh, with a value and a kinds key, and you'll see I put a dropped a vector inside there, so we're sort of composing that together. Uh, we can do some, you know, add some new thing. Oops, new. Th it's really hard to type this way. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you can see that now there's a new key value pair out there, and you can do more than one of these at a time. That's that's fine. You can do that too. Um, and like just like before, you'll see that the original one has not changed. I haven't modified the original. Uh, data structure at all. Um, there's a way to sort of get all of the uh, keys out uh, if I want, uh, or I can get all the values out. Um, and then uh, one of the things you do a lot, of course, is uh, retrieving things. So if I want to get out uh, the name, I pass the get, looks up something in an associative collection, uh, you give it a key and it looks up and it returns to you the value, all right? Um, so something that may not be immediately obvious is that uh, if you have a map, an associative collection, it is a function from its keys to its values, uh, mathematically. Um, so that means that we can actually um, uh, invoke the collection as a function. 
and pass it a key and it returns to you the value. Um, you see that sometimes. Uh, it's useful for containment and things like that at, at times. Um, another thing that may be even less obvious is that um, the keyword uh, actually also implements the function interface and uh, it basically, when you give it a, an, a, an associative collection, it looks itself up as a key in the, so it just passes itself in. So this does the same thing. Um, and this is, uh, I've found that this is something that looks strange to people sometimes when they first encounter it. It's done, uh, it's very, very common in closure code. So it's maybe the most common way to get things out of a map. Um, is you're basically using this keyword, a key in the map as a predicate. Uh, and we'll see this come up a couple more times later on. And then another thing you commonly gonna do is uh, check containment. So, oops. So just, does it have a name or not? Oop. So, and then, you know, it's got some else. And no, it doesn't, all right. So, all right. Quick demo, just to get a little feel for it. So one question you might be asking, isn't this all horribly inefficient, right? Because we're just taking a value and we make a new value and we make a new value and we're just throwing values away. And uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so vectors and maps, uh, which are really the data structures you use most frequently in closure uh, and sets also, are, are sort of backed by uh, this tree uh, and the internal nodes have a uh, very wide branching factor, 32 wide branching factor. So the tree is at most like six levels deep or something like that. Um, so it's a very wide, shallow tree. Um, and when you need to modify that, uh, say we need to add some new element that goes at the end here uh, to this vector, you sort of copy the path back up to the root and he points back to all the old structure that's already there. Um, so this old one here is all immutable. It's all still there. And the new one is, uh, on the right side, is, um, uh, is a new thing, and it's just got pointers into the old stuff. So it's also got a own consistent set of things. Uh, as things sort of go away, uh, you know, eventually they you know, will, will be garbage collected. Um, you tend to create, so you're basically creating lots of little immutable objects. I don't know if anybody saw Charlie Hunt's talk yesterday, but that's exactly what the JVM works well with. Um, so this is nowhere near as inefficient as you might think it is. Uh, it is slower than, than mutable objects uh, for some things. Um, there are actually, there is actually the ability in Clojure to take a persistent, one of these data structures, make it mutable in a very narrow sort of scope, um, add a bunch of stuff to it, and then turn it back to being an immutable data structure. Uh, and that's a common trick that's used in, you know, performance sensitive code. Uh, and it, the immutable aspect of it never leaks out. You can never, you never, you, it's, you're only doing it in a very limited scope. Uh, and if you try to do bad things with it, uh, it will blow up on you. So uh, it doesn't let you sort of treat, uh, do bad, it doesn't let you do bad things in that, when it's in that sort of mutable mode. Um, so that's a pragmatic uh, thing. And I've certainly used this in some, like I've written some serialization code and things like that, that uh, we're making, we're basically pulling a bunch of stuff off the wire and pouring it into collections and things like that. And this is a, the, using that mutable trick in that case is a huge, like gets you get, lets you get close to Java level sort of performance. Um, so it's, it's important in those cases. All right, so that's collections. Um, so sequences. Sequences, so I talked about immutable collections as being immutable values, that being like a really, a key thing for me. Uh, I think the second thing is really sequences. Um, so sequences uh, are really immutable views into a collection. Uh, so it's not a stateful cursor, it's, a, it's an immutable view. Uh, it's basically logically a list um, and you can get back from it uh, the first, so the interface that you have for this abstraction is really give me the first item in this logical list and give me the rest of the list. Um, so you're going to traverse it in order and go through it. Um, there's another function called seek that returns, uh, basically uh, you can give it a collection, it returns to you a, a, a thing that implements this sort of sequence interface. Um, and it, it also hopefully will, it'll never return you an empty sort of thing, an empty list looking kind of thing. You'll either get back um, something or nil, and nil is uh, also treated as false. So 
the seek is often used as like a termination condition check, that sort of thing. Um, because you only need to access one item at a time, uh, it's very easy to create infinite seeks, uh, and that's fine. You can create something that will generate new values as you use it, or will traverse through an object that is being realized as you, uh, as you walk through it. Um, they are often lazy as you, as you use them, but um, you can mostly consider that an implementation detail and ignore it. Um, there are definitely cases where you can't ignore that. Um, but uh, a lot of the time you can just forget that that's, that, um, that that's true. Um, so it, really this is, if you look at Lisp, it's got this rich history of sort of uh, functional programming based on the Lisp data structure. And so what sequences do is say, oh, well all that stuff is really based on this abstraction of a list. Uh, and so let's lift that abstraction off of the Lisp data structure and just use our, do our functional programming on top of this abstraction. And that allows us to then um, make lots of data structures work in, ter in terms of that same, uh, in terms of that same abstraction. Then we open up that library to many different kinds of data structures and things. Uh, so what are some things that can produce a sequence? Um, all those closure collections we had uh, qualify. Strings can be treated as sequences of characters. Arrays are a sequence of values. File seek gives you back a sequence of files in a directory. Line seek is lines in a file. Uh, tags in an XML doc. Rows in a result set. Regular expression matches. Java iterators enumerate. There's lots of stuff, right? And you can make your own. So there's tools to make your own lazy seeks or eager seeks or whatever you need, right? Um, so there's lots of things that produce seeks. That's one big thing. And what can you do with them? This is a partial list of the things that are in the Clojure core library for functions to help you do interesting and useful things on sequences. Um, so like, you know, remove duplicates, filtering, mapping a function over them, reducing them down into a function, splitting them or partitioning or grouping them in different ways. Um, there's just all sorts of stuff out there. And usually the first six months of being a closure programmer uh, consists of writing these functions and then discovering that they already exist in much better <laughs> form. So every closure program I know has been through that period. So, and I'm still finding things like, oh yeah, I never knew that was there. Uh, and then there's other libraries, you know, people, there are other libraries as well. This is the core library. There's other whole you know, libraries other people have written or that are uh, provided as libs um, to do things with. So sort of the grand abstraction here is to take all that, all that stuff, which is our, so we basically represent, we can talk about all of our data in terms of this sequence abstraction. Uh, and we can take this whole library that we have of functions, which is our code for manipulating data, and then sequence goes right in the middle. Um, so it's the thing that connects it. Um, so you get all of your data, all of the stuff, um, and you get this whole library of code, and this is an incredible amount of reuse. This is the reuse you were promised by OOO, but did not get. Right, <laughs> is because you can, all of this data, like you know how to do these things. You know how to filter or map or remove duplicates. Like I know what those are, I do it all the time you know, on a vector, but I can go over and look at the lines in a file and I can use the exact same functions and they work the exact same way. Um, so you get like a tremendous amount of reuse out of these libraries. And if you write your own functions, you can use those too. Like, so I have some own, my own functions that do things like walk through a map and apply a function to all the keys or apply a function to all the values or something like that. That's fine, that works on anything, any mappy type of thing that I can give it. Um, so this is huge. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's a game changer in terms of like how you write your code um, and, and the amount of sort of reuse you get as you go walk into a, a new set of code and understand what's there and how the data works. Um, I've also found that a lot of like refactoring of code um, is really uh, uh, sort of trying to step back and think about the data that exists there and how can I make that naturally a sequence of values. Uh, and oftentimes if you're, if you're fighting with these functions, like sometimes you'll find like you're just fighting these functions. And there's a reason for that because you're fighting the functions. <laughs> That's exactly what you're doing. Uh, and it's because you haven't really thought about your data in terms of a sequence of values. And, and usually if you can recharacterize what you're doing in that way, uh, and it's surprising how often you, you can, then all of a sudden you can, uh, these things start to apply better. And a lot of these that are higher order functions like filter that takes a predicate or 
a map that takes a transformation function and that sort of thing. Those higher order functions, like what you'll find is that when those functions you're passing in are things that already exist or that naturally are easy to write, like when those start to become easier, you're going in the right direction. <laughs> so um, you're not creating anonymous functions and doing a lot of munging around. Uh, so one kind of example here that I wanted to walk through, um, the top function here, line count, just takes a file <coughs> And uh, there's a function called reader that uh, basically takes uh, a lot of different things, actually, and courses them into uh, Java IO reader. Um, and then uh, line seek is one of those functions we just talked about that produces a sequence of lines out of a reader. Um, so this gives me back a sequence of lines. And then I can just call count, right? Counts what I use on vectors or whatever. But I can call that to actually implement a word count function over. So that is, that's a everything you need right there in that top function to count the number of lines in a file. <coughs> um, and uh, the second one here is a predicate, a file to check whether uh, a particular file object, in this case, it's I'm expecting a Java IO file object to come in. Uh, and you're seeing some Java interop here. So dot is file is a, uh, is a uh, calling the Java method is file on the file object. Uh, so if you're interested in how Java interop works, this is the only example of that, I think, in the talk. Um, so that's how it works. Uh, and uh, it's nice. So, and then file counts. Here I'm passing a directory, and I'm gonna read this sort of inside out, and when you've been write, reading Clojure for a long time, you sort of naturally get used to that. Um, but you, starting down at the bottom, uh, you, you take this directory, which say it's a string, uh, which is a path to your directory. You're going to create a j file as a function that creates a Java IO file out of it. Uh, file seek uh, is going to create a uh, sequence of files, Java IO files, in a directory. Uh, and then I'm going to apply my filter function with this file predicate that I just created and say, just filter out, give me the ones that are files and not directories, basically. Uh, and then I'm going to use map. I'm going to map the line count function that I created over that sequence of files, right? And so for each one, it's going to go in and create a reader and count the number of lines or whatever. So I'm going to get back here like a sequence of uh, line counts for each file in the directory. And then I can just use reduce at the end to sum them up. I can take that sequence and crunch them down with plus into a number. It gives me the total line count in the directory. Um, I'm going to take a brief diversion in syntax and say, uh, that if you didn't like reading it in that sort of inside out way, uh, I do like it actually. Um, so I would probably write the code this way. But there are definitely people who that will use uh, some of the arrow macros that can give you sort of an imperative uh, feel to it, a series of steps that you're following. Uh, and this really takes that code and sort of turns it inside out. Uh, so it starts with the directory. It's the exact, this is the exact same code. <laughs> it just take, turns into the file, gets the sequence of files, well, it filters only the files. And then the tricky thing with the double this arrow macro here is it's going to basically drop the result of the prior function into the last parameter in the next function. Um, so filter file, and then you're going to get the result of the previous step get dropped in at the end. Uh, and then the map, the same thing, gets dropped in at the end. And a general convention in the library is that sequence functions take the sequence as the last argument. Uh, and so this, this double arrow here uh, leverages that by, it's usually better for sequency type of things. Um, collection functions, the first set that we saw, things like uh, conj and asos and disos and all those type functions, they take a collection as the first argument. Uh, so there's another macro, which is just a single arrow, and that one actually drops the result of the previous one in as the first argument. Um, so that one tends to be better for when you're working directly with a collection. Um, and uh, there, there is, so it, as you go through the library, you'll find that if you're aware of that distinction, uh, it can help sort of alert you to which sort of mode you're in. Um, so uh, this basically, this macro is going to rewrite this, what you have here at compile time into exactly the same code that we just had, or very close to that. Uh, that's probably the last time I'll talk about macros, too. So <laughs> it's another whole broad area. Um, so let's see, time check. We're halfway in, right? OK. So generic data interface. This is where the meat of the talk is, actually. So, uh, and I didn't know exactly what to call this, um, th this section of the talk. Uh, but it's something that I really deeply appreciate about, uh, about Clojure. Um, so I'm going to try to 
forgot how to talk about it here. <laughs> but um, so say you have some domain model. This is a domain model. I run conferences, uh, some conferences. So this is like a domain model for a conference. Probably not a very good one. It doesn't really matter. So we've got a talk and a speaker and things like that, right? So in Java, I actually went over for that, for that speaker thing here. I actually just took the first three fields and I went over to Eclipse and I wrote down some fields and then I hit all of the things that generated code after that. <laughs> so I generated a constructor and I created the getters and setters, I created the hash code, and I created the equals, and I created the two string. So, whoo, I'm there. So, but this is crazy. Do you agree this is crazy? That we have to do this for every single entity? And then usually it's not even what you want, right? You have to go in and change it after that. So, I don't know, that's just, this that just has always irked me. So, like, the, this, this notion of having, what you're doing here is you're creating this custom data, we're creating new functions, right? These are this set Twitter, get Twitter, and they're only scoped to this particular object. Like, they're just, they're only good for this, right? If you actually want to like reuse them in some way, you need to create an interface that has more methods and then extend, you know, put that interface on all the things that need to get that out. Um, and uh, that's crazy. So um, Clojure does not do that. And that's, uh, that's one of the things I really like about it. And the, sort of the other point to make here is that going back to the composite object, composite value thing, is that, you know, you don't, you, you don't need the, the hash code and equals fall out of the, um, uh, out of the composite value stuff. So you don't have to create those. They're, I mean, they're, you're just not gonna do that. Um, there are ways to customize printing uh, and do things like that, um, but uh, usually you don't do that either. But so, so the, the important part is those fields up there. That's the part, that's the essential part of this. There's a ton of ceremony here, right, that we can strip away. So sort of the, the easiest way to represent an entity, not the only way, is uh, to represent it with a map. So I can just say, I'll just represent me. Um, here's some keywords that represent my fields. There's my values, and I didn't, I don't have to say anything else, right? I've got a quality, I've got hash code, um, I've got two string, all those are built in. If I wanna actually go get the, the values out of it, I can use all the things that exist for maps already. They're already there. Um, one thing you might miss is a type of some kind. So one solution to that is to add a field and it tells you what the type is. Um, this is not sufficient for everything you need to do, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, so here's some more entities, just some examples, an attendee, a sponsor. Uh, you'll notice that email is in all of these. There's a common key here. So instead of like, if I wanted to go do an email blast or something, I need to get the emails from all my sponsors, and attendees, and speakers, or whatever. I need to go create an emailable interface, and then I need to have all of those domain entities that implement that, just so I can call get email. So I know that, just to tell the language that get email on these set of kinds of objects means the same thing, and that's, um, you don't need to do that in Clojure. You can just use concat to put all those things together, and then you can map the email function. So email here is a, this is where we're using the keyword as a predicate. Uh, and you'll see this very commonly. Um, you're just gonna map email over the entities and it's gonna give you back a sequence of email addresses for everybody in your organization. And at that point, I have a sequence. So I can do things like remove nil if I want to. I can, uh, I can do distinct, which will remove duplicates from it. I can sort it, I can do, there's lots of things I can do with it at that point um, as a sequence. I can just start working with it as data. I'm always in this mode of having data that I already know how to work with and functions that I know, that know how to work on that data. Um, so they're sort of like universal getters and setters, like these keywords. You do still have to agree on keywords at that point. If you wanted to, like if I called one email and one email address, then I don't get that. So, and so that, that's still there. You, see, you know, I can't, it do, you can't do everything with it, but <laughs> it's, not, it, it's not semantically aware, right? Um, so you still do have to exercise care and thought as you program, but that's, that's okay. Um, so if you wanna, so you just use it as a map, right? And you can uh, you know, add new fields into it with a SOS. Uh, you can get things out of it. We've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, if you really want to, you can grab all the keys that are in your entity. So think about what you'd have to do if you wanted to grab all of the fields that are actually currently set in your Java object. You, know, you can do that with reflection. It's, that's ugly code. You don't want to write that code. Um, and you just wouldn't do that. You would never ask that question in, in Java. And there's, 
lots of cases where it's useful to talk about your objects in that way and to, to look dynamically at the fields that are in your object and do things. Um, you might also, like, maybe you need to troll through all the values out there and look for, uh, you know, to uppercase all the values in your domain model or something like that. You could easily do that in Clojure. That's not a big deal. Um, but that would be, there's just not even any way you would think about doing that in Java or something. Uh, another thing you get sort of that falls out of all this is this notion of traversable entities. So now we've been talking about single entities, but once you get sort of nested things, um, there's actually a set of functions that are these dash in functions, get in, update in, associ in, that lets you actually um, walk down and talk about things in nested entities. Um, so you can do things like, um, uh, say I have a track, I really meant a talk there. So if, say you have a talk that has a speaker in it and that speaker has a first name, I can do this to walk down through those nested entities and pull out the first name of the speaker in a track or a topic or whatever. Um, similarly, and, and that's cool, that's, but you can kind of do that with nested, with chaining methods or whatever in Java and stuff like that. Uh, and this respects nils and does the right thing in, in most cases for that. Um, update in, though, is really cool because I can say uh, traverse through track down to speaker, down to his last name, and apply the uppercase function at, down at that point. Uh, and it'll give you back the new top level entity that has this deeply nested changes in it, right? <clears throat> and this is really, really useful. Uh, Asosin is kind of similar, but it's specific to keys. So it lets you add a new key value pair at some nested point down in your data structure or in more than one nested uh, key value pair. Uh, and this really goes to, uh, you can't, and at times you'll build these uh, you'll have these big composite values that represent your domain, like big chunks of your domain. And you can just uh, apply a function to them to move to a new value of the domain. And it's a composite, there's a big composite value on both sides. And I've said something very concise um, to make that happen. And the way that those, the way that you get from one to the other uh, goes back to the state model, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. It, it works well along with that. Um, there's a couple different ways that are that are in the existing the libraries that you get um, to uh, walk through and do things across the entire data structure. Um, so this is a uh, an example of using the closure.walk library, um, and it, there are some issues with closure walk, um, and there are some reasons not to use it in some cases, um, but it's really useful as well. It basically will walk through nested composite values and applies this function, so it basically applies this function to every nested um, node inside this composite value. Um, so this thing is looking for, inside this, you know, this big domain structure that I have, look for something that's associative, it's map-like, and it has a key that is Twitter, and if so, uh, prefix it with the app symbol. So I, don't, I decided I'm gonna represent things differently in my domain model, I don't want just the ID, I want it to be like at ID, whatever. So this lets me walk through the entire data structure and apply that change. Uh, it's doing a depth first tree walk, so you are gonna have nodes on the stack. That's one of the reasons that, uh, it, so you can actually build your stack with large uh, domain models like this. Um, so there are some, some cases where you, you need to be careful about how you use this exactly. Um, zippers is, is another functional data structure that gives you, uh, it allows you to traverse and modify the tree uh, as its own functional tree-like data structure. Uh, and it's beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, there's lots of stuff uh, out there written about it. I've written a very lengthy article that's out on the de developer works or something. Uh, if you go search, you'll find it. Um, and uh, we've built a bunch of things that allow you to apply uh, tree transformations to, uh, uh, to trees using zippers, uh, and they can be made uh, very efficient. Um, and so we've gotten a lot of mileage out of that as a, just a general technique for uh, editing and manipulating trees, which come up a lot. Uh, so back to uh, the representation of our entities. Sometimes it's useful, I mean, a lot of times it's useful to uh, switch behavior based on type. Um, and you can do that, you can certainly do that with a, uh, with a uh, attribute that's telling you what the type is and you create a function that looks for that type and that sort of thing. Um, but there is um, another way to, to do this enclosure, and that's to 
uh, create a record. So def record allows you to create a speaker record that has this set of fields. So if you go back, think back to that big Java Eclipse nonsense, um, this is saying the same thing. <laughs> it's, and it's actually literally going to generate a Java class under the hood that has those fields and implements a lot of that stuff. Uh, it's not a, probably not exactly what you're imagining as far as the implementation goes, but that's, conceptually that's exactly what it is. Um, and it is idiomatic to capitalize the name because it's really creating a Java type under the hood, uh, and we're going to leverage that uh, to some degree later on. So, like, if you look at the class of the class of the function that does dot get class on an object, um, and uh, that's going to tell you that it's a speaker, a Java speaker class. Um, and then the, there's some uh, factory functions, some constructor functions that get generated automatically from def record. Uh, one of them is this arrow type that lets you sort of take positionally take all of the fields to initialize it with. There's also one that lets you uh, pass a map of whatever key value pairs you want. Um, uh, field, so you pass just partial sets of fields and things like that. And generally, if if there if you've only got like one or two fields, it's you're probably going to use the positional one. But I find once if I want to write code that I expect people to read later on. Typically, these, these two lines of code are not together, right? The record is defined in one place, and it's used somewhere way, way different. In that case, I really want to pass in a map that has the explicit fields in it so, I, so people know what, what I'm talking about. Um, so I probably use the map one more commonly. But, um, and once you get it, a record is actually is a map. It, it implements all the same interfaces as map. It looks like a map. Uh, you can associate, get it, all of everything that I've talked about up till now in terms of the generic data interfaces is all still true, except for closure walk, which I think doesn't support records right now. Um, but almost everything else that we've just talked about uh, still still works just it, literally identically. Um, you wouldn't have to make any changes to any of your code. Uh, so here's a little example of uh, uh, defining a card in terms of a suit and a value, and I think there are uh, defensively better ways to actually implement this, but uh, as an example, uh, so say we define some suits. So we've got a vector which has all our suits in it. We've got a uh, way uh, here. I've, I've done a little bit of uh, closure-y stuff to uh, build up the set of values that I want to use for my um, uh, the, the different value, uh, values in a suit. So range 2 to 11 is going to give me all the numbers from 2 to um, 10, basically. Uh, and I'm going to map string over it, so I'm just going to turn those numbers into strings. And I'm going to concatenate that sequence with this Jack, Queen, King, Ace values. Uh, and I'm going to turn all those into keywords. So there's some, some little code there to do that. Um, and then so I can create a full deck using, here I'm using a for comprehension actually, which we're not going to talk about much. But for every suit in suits and every value in values, I'm going to invoke the constructor. So this is going to return to me a sequence of um, card instances with all the possible suit and value combinations. Uh, so now I've got a full deck. Um, it, it turns out that shuffle is actually one of the built-in closure core functions, which randomizes a collection. So you can actually shuffle. I didn't have that on here, but you can shuffle your deck if you like. Uh, <laughs> it happens to work really well. Um, if you want to cut, um, cut the deck, take the top half, put it on the bottom. Uh, you can use, uh, you can basically drop uh, drop the first half, that gives you the bottom half. Take the second half, that gives you the top half. You can then concatenate them on top of each other. Um, there's actually a function called split at, um, which is, this is one of those things where you just troll through the library and you'll eventually find the thing you want to do. Um, so that it says basically split at a particular index. Um, so you can do, there's an alternate implementation based on that. Um, so just some examples of using a sequences and records together, things like that. Uh, so polymorphism. So we haven't talked at all about behavior and how we uh, sort of dynamically choose which code to run. Because polymorphism is good, right? We want to have the ability to have uh, like uh, pers different kinds of people, but then apply something to all of them, right? Uh, this comes up all the time. It's a good thing. We want to do it. Um, you can just do it with conditional logic, right? I mean, you can do that that way in imperative code, and you can do it in OO code. And, and that's, in some cases, that's the right answer. Um, the two major mechanisms for sort of uh, dynamically choosing a function implementation in Clojure are multi-methods and protocols. And they're both useful for different things. So uh, I use both on a regular basis. Um, multi-methods, um, 
are going to switch based on a dispatch function. So they let you do a broad range of things. Um, so they're very flexible, um, but they're a little slower. So, and then protocols are really switching specifically based on type. So they have a much narrower range of things you can switch on. It happens to be exactly the same thing that you would switch on in OO, uh, and it happens to be very fast in the JVM because that's what, it, what uh, virtual function calls are based on, things like that. Um, so it has some performance advantages. It has a little bit less flexibility in, in those terms. Um, it, um, let me get in a little bit of example here. Talk about it a little bit more. So if we're gonna define a multi-method here, I'm defining a function area uh, that by default is gonna take a single argument and I'm going to specify the dispatch, some arbitrary dispatch function. And here, again, I'm using a keyword as a function. So colon type is a predicate that's going to apply itself to an associative value, which is the incoming function value. And then the result of that dispatch function is gonna let me choose um, which of these method implementations I'm gonna pick. So based on a value, so colon circle or colon square are the two values that might come out in this case, and they're gonna allow me to pick one of these methods. Um, here on, in the argument list, I'm actually uh, destructuring the map inside the argument list. So I'm taking in a map and I'm actually assigning the variable radius to the value of the radius key in the map. I haven't talked about destructuring at all. I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. It's awesome and it's a good thing, but uh, you know, I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. Um, so that, doing the same thing in the square one, when you apply this, so I've, say I've got an entity that's got type square, side five, I can apply area to it, it's going to go through dispatch function, pull out square, look up the square one, and eventually invoke that, right? The side, time side side, right? Um, so that's great. Um, w so one of the reasons this is a little slower is that I ran two functions there, right? I ran the first function, the dispatch function, and then I ran another function. Um, so it is a little bit slower, uh, and uh, it has gotten faster over the years as the implementation has been uh, tweaked a little bit. <clears throat> uh, I, think, I think there is hope that, the, that it could be made faster still with Invoke Dynamic, and it hasn't really been worked on much yet, but I'm hopeful that that will be true. Um, so protocols, so here we're gonna define a protocol named Shape. Um, and a protocol is actually not just one function, it's actually a collection of functions. Uh, and so you will naturally be reminded of, you, will, you might naturally think of it as an interface. And I think it's actually a dangerous way to think of it um, because while it has many, shares many characteristics with interfaces, that's uh, not where I find that it shines in code. Um, that an interface from a, like a Java perspective is really a collection of functions. And uh, in Clojure, I've found that namespaces are really a more natural way to collect define an API as a collection of functions. Uh, that, that's what that, is. the namespace does that. It collects functions that you can use. Um, I found protocols to be excellent for representing uh, SPIs, sort of service provider interfaces. What's the base part underneath that I wanna plug in? So I might have this really broad API and it might surface some parts of the SPI directly, but it might also build a bunch of utility functions that are uh, over the top that are the same, regardless of what SPI you're plugging in on the bottom. Um, but anyways, in this case, we're just using it in a very narrow sense here to get polymorphism. So we've created this protocol shape. Again, it's capitalized. It actually does create um, Java interfaces and things under the hood. Um, and that's how we start to get some performance benefits is we can leverage all, the, all that polymorphic call stuff that's in Java and is really fast. Uh, I've defined records for circle and square. I didn't have those in the last slide. Uh, but because protocols switch on type, I really need something, I need, I need a type uh, that's specific to my entity. So here I've defined real records with uh, circle and square, and then I extend the protocol shape to the type circle and to the type square. And here I actually implement the function with all, and these, the implementation is exactly the same, right? Um, I've extended these both together, but there's no reason that has to be done. You can extend a protocol in one place to one type, you can extend it in another place to another type, you can later on come in with some new code and extend it again at that point. Um, so it's, it's an open system, just like multi-methods are an open system. Uh, and then you invoke it exactly the same way. Um, the only difference really is that um, the, uh, I'm using the record syntax to construct things there. All right, so 
identity and state. So we're, we've got 10 minutes to talk about identity and state. So there's no way we'll do that, but we'll try. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go back to objects for a second and talk about, say you've got a talk uh, named bacon and the abstract is bad. So clearly not a good abstract. Um, and in this case, so for objects, identity is wrapped tightly around the object, right? The object is, has an identity to it. It has these fields in it. And an object is kind of like a whiteboard, right? You're going you're gonna to write some, I wrote these values down on my whiteboard, and someone comes along and they want to change the abstract to something better. Uh, I'm going to erase abstract and write a new value in there, right? Is good. Um, so good, we made it better. So we might say at that point, you know, we should really, we should really make this into a workshop because that's, we should really focus on this a little bit more, I think. So now we've, we've made a couple changes here and we've still got, if, if say you got the original, say we were back here and you got this original version of the object, then like you've still got, you've got the same object, right? You've still got the same identity um, and it's changed underneath you. The thing that you had is now changed. And this is where mutable, mutable objects change over time. They exist in a timeline, but they don't have any way to communicate to observers that they're changing. Right? You just can go ask it things and you might get different answers, right? Uh, it's very unsatisfying. <laughs> so you look at all the problems with Java concurrency. Uh, last time I was here, I was talking about, I did a whole hour talk about problems with Java concurrency. Um, that's what the talk was about. You go look it up, it's got a whole list of things, right? Um, and I remember Rich commented, Rich was at the same conference talking about, same here three years ago, talking about closure for the first time, I think. And uh, uh, afterwards, he told me how terrified he was by the whole talk. But, um, <laughs> but that's why he's working on closure, right? So, um, uh, so the problem is that locks and concurrency models um, start to address that, but they can't address it. I mean, it, it's, it's not possible for you to, um, to perceive all of these things together at the same time. Um, so, and and that's, that's something that composite values provide. You can actually get a value, and it's not gonna change. I can do whatever I want to it at that point. I can look at it in whatever way I want. It's never gonna change. Nobody else can mess me up. Uh, in ob with mutable objects, somebody else can mess you up. Um, I forgot I had this in there. So I've got this slide, uh, this quote from uh, SICP, famous computer science book, scheme, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think it's really fascinating because they highlight in here that uh, dealing with objects change and identity are a fundamental consequence of the need to grapple with time in our computational models. So they're, they're on it. They're, as always, they're, this stuff has all been done, right? Um, so Edward Moybridge, I don't know if everybody's ever familiar with this guy. Um, this is back in the 1870s. So Leland Stanford, the governor of California, uh, hired him to settle a conjecture about whether when a horse galloped, whether all four feet came off the ground at the same time, right? And nobody knew. They, it was just, they were debated it, right? So what he did was he set up 15 cameras and he put a tripwire to the shutter and stretched it across the, the race course and, uh, and so that as the horse went down, it would trip each of those shutters. And so you got 15 frames. You can clearly see in the second one, he's off the ground, right? Um, so I see some analogies here to what I'm talking about in that um, we're sort of perceiving our software and time in our world as continuous, but in our software, we don't want it to be continuous. We want it to be discretized. We want it quantums where we can perceive the state of a composite value at a particular time and um, look at all the different parts of it. We don't want to like go say get legs and get the stuff from the first frame and then get head and get the stuff from the second frame and get jockey and get the thing from the third frame or whatever. You know, we want to pull a particular frame out and that's our composite value. And then we can do whatever we want with it, right? It's time's gone on and we're whatever. And we can perceive, we can choose to perceive the, this value at different time, but every time we do, we get a whole complete perceivable snapshot. Um, and this is the core of the uh, closure state model. So. It's, I have, this is not collapsed down in one thing, I've lifted the identity off the top of the value. And identity, it still exists. We still have those things where like, we have uh, this talk, it's still the thing that's changing through time, right? I still care about that as a concept. Um, but it's a series of composite immutable values that exist through time. So I've got it here and then I called, I, I invoked a function, a pure function that took a composite immutable value and produced a new composite immutable value, and then I invoked another function, and it produced another one. 
So each of these things inside the identity is an immutable value. It's good. Um, and the state is just, we happen to ask for it now, and that's what we get. That's our state, right? Um, and time might be continuing after that, and that's fine. We've got something, a thing that's good at the time. Um, so representing state, there's really four uh, different things we have uh, for representing state enclosure. VARs we've already talked about a little bit. I'm not gonna talk about them much more. Oops. And then atoms are really this notion of I've got a single timeline and I'm gonna coordinate access to it, but I don't need to coordinate with other things. I just, I just got like a counter or a, a single value that I wanna coordinate. Uh, and I'll, it will go through a series of changes, but it doesn't need to co coordinate with something else. Um, refs are when I really need lots of things that, that are talk, I need to take a bunch of these single identity timelines and at times they need to meet. I need to perceive you know, the uh, multiple bank accounts at the same time and apply a transaction that takes me to a new state in my world. And I don't need to involve globally the world to do that. I need to involve the, ob the identities that are actually uh, changing or being read at that time so I see a consistent view. Um, agents are, are a little like atoms in that they are single timeline coordination, but they're asynchronous. So there's basically a queue in front of it. And you say, I've got some state over here. I'm going to apply a function, but I don't need the result back. Just go apply this function uh, when, you, when you get to it and apply a series of functions in a row. Um, all of these have this property of perception. So it, all of these have a thing called deref. Well, the atoms, refs, and agents have this thing called deref. <clears throat> which is uh, actually, there's a little bit of syntax sugar with the at symbol. So you can say at a atom or a ref or an agent, and you get back the current value, a current value, right? It's, it's a consistent value at the point where I perceived it. And doing that is cheap. So it's okay to do that all the time. And so as opposed to like actors or something like that, if I want to get a value of an actor, I have to send it a message, right? And it has to send me back uh, a value in some way. Um, so, but I, I can always see the state that's out there uh, as an observer, and that's really important. Um, so I talked about atoms. This is an example with a counter. Um, so you declare an atom, and then uh, it's just applying this series of functions in a row, right? And every time I call this ID function, it's going to swap uh, the counter. It's going to apply the inc function, increment, it's a plus one function, to the current state of the atom, and then put that back in the atom. Uh, and, that, and if two threads come in at the same time, try to do it at the same time, that's okay. One will spin, basically spin wait, spin lock, waiting for that to be okay. Um, so there's limited um, things this is useful for. But uh, anytime you'd use one of the atomic classes in Java Util Atomic, uh, that's, that's the equivalent kind of thing. Um, and there are some other use cases for it too. Uh, so refs are really interesting. This is, uh, there's actually a whole software transactional memory system, which I haven't mentioned yet. <laughs> so um, it's just kind of a big thing. Um, so this allows you to coordinate uh, multiple identities together. So we can create a ref. Again, it's a thing that wraps around a value. It's all, all of these wrap around a single immutable value at any given point in time. Um, so this, this yo-yo function, uh, I'm going to put that thing in the, in the one, and we're just going to swap it back and forth between the two refs, right? So I need to coordinate the identities, these two different identities that have values. And it, multiple threads might be banging on this at the same time. That's OK. <clears throat> Which, so uh, the, what you do there is just, you're going to just set the, you're going to, I'm going to read the values. Here, I'm derefing. <clears throat> I'm going to read two values at a particular sort of uh, time point that includes uh, my two refs, and then I'm gonna swap the values of them, that's all. And then I'm gonna return it just so I can see it too. Um, and then the key thing, the key difference is here is that there's a transaction. So do sync defines a transaction boundary. And that says to the STM, in this thing, I'm gonna go make some changes to some set of objects, R1 and R2. There could be other objects out there too, I don't care, right? Those, I don't care about those, but I need to make sure that R1 and R2 are in a consistent state um, together and then I'm gonna make a change that takes them to a new state um, uh, together. So this allows me to get the A, C, and I, the out of acid, uh, are all there. Um, so uh, that's great. Um, it might find out that somebody else is trying to do the same thing, right? So in that case, the, tra the transaction will fail and it will get automatically retried. 
Um, so the STM is protecting you from that. And there are a bunch of, there's a whole bunch, of, there's another whole talk <laughs> to talk about this. So, um, uh, so I'm not gonna try to do that. But it actually uses MVCC under the hood with uh, adaptive history and snapshot isolation and a bunch of stuff. So it's just like Oracle or something like that, some database technology for dealing with multiple uh, things. And it's optimistic, so you know, you're able to, if things go ahead well, then you can do a lot of stuff in parallel. There's a lot of concurrency benefits. Uh, I'm almost done, by the way. Um, so agents um, is basically the same thing as, as what we had for uh, atoms, but there's a queue on the front. So you're sort of sending functions over to something. Um, and at any time, I can perceive it with DREF. So, so to sum up, my contention is that objects are not composite values and that programming with composite values is awesome, um, way more awesome than objects. Um, uh, collections and closure are immutable composite values. Sequences are an awesome abstract, abstraction for sitting between composite values and functional programming. Um, closure has a wealth of tools for dealing, providing generic data interfaces over all that data stuff that you have. Uh, and finally, that identity and state are, something, are a distinct thing from values, and Clojure has a bunch of tools for dealing with that uh, as well. Uh, so if you're interested in this stuff, um, two talks that are on InfoQ, Are We There Yet? is really about the identity state stuff. Value of values is really about uh, why values are important. Um, those are two I'd recommend. Uh, that's all I have. Thanks. <laughs>